All right, so again, so we have our summative assessment. This is the outline of the unit, whether it's gonna be a full unit or we're gonna divide it up, et cetera, very detailed. Okay, so now let's get into what does this actually look like? I'm in the classroom, I actually gotta teach this day to day. What is this actually gonna look like? All right, so let's go into here, um, down to here. And what I did is, it was hard, it would be hard to do a, a whole lot of planning when I'm not actually in the classroom with students and seeing what, what's actually happening. So what I did is I did two weeks of lesson plans um, of if I, like I said, if I were actually going back in the classroom to do this, what would I do? And so I did two weeks worth, you can see a, sort of a week one and a week two. And again, if you, um, actually hang on just for a second, I gotta, Stop sharing just for a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so again, as I mentioned up here in red, this is very, very detailed because it's a sample. If as a teacher, if I'm doing my lesson plans for the week, I don't need to write down every single detail I'm going to do, but I wanted you to be able to see what I was actually thinking about when I went in here, especially since I didn't don't have like the actual like lesson plan to give you or whatever. And this is just a, a basic template. It's just five days, you know, simple, you know, I, I don't have a label day one, two, three, four, and five, but it's just basically five days. And what I decided to do, and again, this is all editable. If it, if it doesn't work for you, you don't have to do this, is I divided it into three columns. So I divided it into what are the learning outcomes I'm going to focus on for the week? What am I going to focus on when we're face-to-face -face or live together when we're synchronous? And then what am I going to have the kids do when they're on their own outside of class or even if they're in class doing self-paced? And um, I want to talk about this right here really quickly just for a second about this self-paced even when we're in class in the synchronous a, a lot of uh, teachers and i think you ran into this and i heard a lot of teachers say this is it was hard and and as a parent of a child who was also doing this type of learning my son is in high school was had to do this also in the fall i'm sorry in the spring was that a kid can't just sit there in front of the screen for if you're like okay you got to have a 50 minute class three days a week or whatever a student can't sit there in front of the screen for 50 minutes and if you think about your classroom we don't ever teach for 50 minutes straight we may teach for 10 minutes and then the kids go do some activities with partners or they go on the computer or we do a game or we do all sorts of things so when we're face to face we don't teach nonstop, and the kids just sit there and listen so think about that when you're doing if you're doing remote or even if you have some kids in class with you and some kids who are remote think about the way that you teach in the regular classroom and it can be so we do 10 minutes on the video call and then I'm going to put you in breakout rooms I'm going to have you go for 20 minutes and work on something on your own and then everybody come back in 20 minutes and we're going to pick up and we're going to see what you did so think about that it doesn't have to be constant me running the show while we're in the zoom call or while we're in the class the kids again universal design for learning we've talked about we have that there's that self-paced aspect in there the other thing that is helpful is this is like i said i know a lot of districts are going to be where some of the kids are in live but other kids are tuning in remotely at the same time and you're like oh my gosh how am i supposed to teach where i'm, I'm teaching kids live and i've got kids remote and we talked about some strategies for that in a different session i forget which one but i know we talked about it but the other thing to think about is actually that does give some opportunities for some of the self-paced work because if say i spend the first 15 minutes of the call or the zoom call or the um face-to-face -face or whatever 15 minutes is me doing some interaction with the kids in the classroom or teaching a lesson or you know doing a, showing a video and talking about it, whatever i'm whatever i'm material i'm presenting and then maybe the next part of class the kids are able to go they go into stations and the stations could be virtual which they may have to be even if you're face to face with the whole six foot distance thing or whatever is that now if i have kids who are in class and out of class and, and and again this means this is meaning that if kids have access to like a chromebook or something like that that they can do small group work with their peers who are not in class because they can do it together digitally or i can have kids i say okay you got 20 minutes to work on this you know watch this video and do this reading and also i can work one-on-one -on -one with students or i can do some small group work or i can put some kids in a breakout room and i'm going to go work with them so think about that when you're planning your synchronous versus your self-paced and asynchronous that it doesn't all have to be just because we're face to face or in a live class that it's me on the stage for for 50 straight minutes because we don't even do that in a regular class so i just wanted to point that out um, and we had another lesson about how do you determine what self, what do we do in class versus what self-paced, and you'll see in this example sort of how that plays out. 
So anyway, so if you look at the learning outcomes in the first column for the first five days, and like I said, there's a second week too, but you'll notice it's all, it's activating prior knowledge. And then the rest of it is there's interpretive, 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 and then a little bit of interpersonal, a little bit more interpersonal, then some more interpretive, some more interpretive, and then some presentational. So you notice that if, I mean, any, all of us who, who know about second language acquisition, we all know this, that the kids have to have a lot of input before they can produce some language. So if I want my students to be able to have a conversation with either written or verbal with their classmates, I've got to make sure they're getting something that they're reading and hearing or seeing the language before I ask them to actually write it. So before I can write, I have to read. Before I can speak, I have to hear it or view it for signing. So you'll notice that it's all about the different modes over here on the left-hand side. There's no vocab or grammar specific in the outcomes. That's embedded into everything we do in the lesson because vo as we mentioned before, vocab and grammar are not a learning outcome. I don't teach you a, a list of vocab. The outcome is not you can list, you know, 20 items of clothing. That makes no sense. That's not an outcome. The outcome is that I can just, I can tell you, I can recommend what clothing to take on your trip based on the weather. So the outcome is a presentational, like a recommendation or a function or something like that. So that's why you'll see in the learning outcomes, there's no vote. I mean, the only one where it came a little bit was just activating the prior knowledge, but there, an outcome is not vocab or grammar. An outcome is what they're actually doing with the language. Okay, so disagreeing the functions of the language, et cetera. Okay, so that's the learning outcome. So there's a lot of, I hit all the modes in there throughout the, the first five days. The, I'm actually going to jump over to the asynchronous before I go to the synchronous um, because the, 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 the two, again, play together. Um, you know, the, they build off of each other. So notice that the asynchronous about what can the kids really do on their own. If you look at the types of activities, you'll see reading reading, reading, Quizlet practice of some vocabulary, a video with comprehension questions on the video again. So I have spent the first four days, what they're doing on their own is all the interpretive stuff because you want to really think when the kid, when I have the kids with me, what's the biggest stuff I want to focus on and what I want to focus on with their, when they're with me is that interpersonal, that finding out what they do know and helping them build their skills with it. So when you'll see, when we go to the synchronous, it's all about what are we doing together or, and how am I supporting the kids? Asynchronous, the self-paced, they don't need me to sit with them while they watch a video. They can watch a video 10 times as long as they have the scaffolded ed puzzle or activities or whatever to do with it. Okay, so you'll notice it's the reading, it's the video, there's Quizlet practice or whatever other, you know, there might be a flip grade in there, an ed puzzle or something. And then it's not till the fifth day that they actually have creation where they're gonna do a presentational task. And you'll, um, we'll get to what that's going to be in a second. So, but again, they can do the presentational task on their own. They can make, this is going to be either a video or a flyer. They can do that on their own. They don't need me to do there, to do that. They can, when they come to class, then that's where I can work with them and I can help them. So when you're trying to determine what do I do synchronous face-to-face -face or live and what do I do asynchronous, if it's something that they can do without me, make it asynchronous. If it's something that I'm going to have to tell them 10 times, like practice the vocab or how to do kanji gamos or whatever it is that you're doing in there or a flip grid, make it asynchronous, make a video. So if they say, hey, wait, I forget about this, you can say there's the video, go watch the video. And then after you've watched it, come to me and then we'll work with it. So that's another key piece, thinking about the asynchronous. If they don't need me to do it, especially in, in the way this year is going to go with the virtual, put it outside of the class. Okay, the synchronous then, the face-to-face -face or whether we're in Zoom or Google Meets, whatever, you know, whatever the situation plays out, <clears throat> excuse me, is where I'm going to do a lot of stuff where we're working together. So you'll notice, for example, I, we had talked earlier about activating the prior knowledge. So we're going to play categories. And for me, categories was always, when we were face-to-face, -face, was I gave the kids a topic. They were all in small groups. I gave them a topic, like, and I'm picking topics related to what we're going to use in this unit. So things like weather, clothing, locations, Paris monuments, activities, Disney characters, okay? So when we would do this in class, they would be in small groups with a piece of paper. I'd give them a minute. They'd write everything they could for that topic. And then we'd go around the room and everybody would read their list. And, and if anyone had the same thing, you had to cross it off. And then you got points based on what you'd come up with that nobody else in the class came up with. So sort of a fun thing to do. 
doing that virtually probably might be a little bit more difficult, but we could still do it whether we could do it in Google Docs where we say, okay, I'm going to put it up and maybe they each have, you know, their own section on Google Docs, their little pod each has a, a section like, okay, come up with everything you can that's related to um, clothing, everything you remember. And so you could do it where they start crossing off or whatever it might be tough. It's, that's really not the point. But the point is that they're doing it in Google Docs or they do it in the chat box or they do it in breakouts on a document. The point is I want them to do it on something that I'm going to be able to save so I can share the results with them later for practice. So if I do it in a chat box, I can save the, ch this, um, the chat. Or if I do it in a breakout room and they do it in Google Docs, I can save it. <clears throat> because you'll notice over here, on day two, they're going to be doing a Quizlet practice using that vocab that we came up with during the categories. So by having it already saved, I can provide them those resources. I can put it into a Quizlet really fast when, through an Excel spreadsheet or whatever. And so the kids have it. So basically what they're doing is they're creating the vocab that we need to practice. And then I just have to manipulate it and give them a way to practice it. Okay, so that's one thing we would do for categories. The other thing we're gonna to do to activate the prior knowledge is we're just do, gonna do a Padlet, um, and students are just gonna put in the Padlet, what do you know about Disney, about an amusement park, about any tourist sites in the US or your native country or in France? And I talked about that earlier. By making it broad enough that everybody can at least talk about, like I said, something that's a tourist site. And like I said, they, and they may be like, oh, in France, totally the Eiffel Tower. I mean, I, I think you know most kids know about the Eiffel Tower. So even if they've never been there, they can talk about that. So that's how we're, we're going to spend the first that first class just focusing on activating prior knowledge. We can do all of this in the target language. They may be writing like the second one. They may be writing this on the Padlet in English, but I'm still speaking in the target language. We can still do it in the target language. Some of the stuff they may be able to be doing in the target language, but that's okay because we're just activating the prior knowledge. It's not about the second one is not about language production. It's about knowledge production. Okay, and so as they post in, maybe they're posting in English on the Padlet, I'm speaking in French about, oh, c'est Mickey, or, you know, or, or whatever, or is that, oh, les Montagnes Russes is a, an amusement park, or, you know, I mean, a, sorry, a roller coaster or something like that. Okay, so we're doing target language the whole time. Someone had asked another question during the live session today about comprehensible input, about how do we keep this comprehensible? And you'll see in everything that we do when we're face to face, Everything is that I can do this all in the target language because I'm going to have a lot of visuals. I'm going to be able to do a lot of um, simple language. I'm doing language that's targeted to what they can do. And I'm using, you'll see the resources. I'm using things that they've actually created and other things that they've already practiced ahead of time. As far as the, the making it comprehensible in the student version, we talked about that earlier. So, and actually we can... Um, go ahead and look at some of these. I know I'm jumping back and forth. I apologize, just sort of <laughs> jump with me, I guess. If you notice like in here, I, I would never, I usually wouldn't write this in my lesson plan, but it would be what was on the actual handout that I gave the kids. And again, this can be done online or offline. But what they usually do with a video, like the reading, we've already talked about actual appendix D, so I don't need to do that. But what I usually do with a video is I'm gonna break it down and so I'm just different strategies to scaffold it. So the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna watch this promo video with no sound, no closed captions. And all I want you to do while you're watching it is English is just write down 10 things you noticed or understood just by watching the video with no sound. We had talked about that, I think in another session, I think on the interpretive, where you can learn a lot, you can understand a lot just by watching the video. And as soon as the kids watch the video in the target language, they start getting hung up and distracted by the target language. So this forces them, no target language allowed. You're only allowed to just look at it and tell me everything you understood. And that helps them realize I can understand a lot more than I thought I could just by the visuals. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to break the video up because even though it's only five minutes, there is a lot of, there's, it's two people who are talking and they're talking quickly. And so I found sections of the video that I thought were bite-sized enough that they could understand. So like the first 60 seconds, and I literally, at a novice, I probably wouldn't do this as much with intermediate, but I literally said, you have to watch the video at least three times with the sound on, no closed captions, because a lot of times you can put on closed captions. And again, now I want you to write more in French or English than anything that you understood. Okay, so first you got what you got, you wrote what you understood without any language. Now when you're listening to it at least three times, write anything you did that you understood. And these are activities that when we were face to face, we would do it together in class. 
it's not now that my face-to-face -face time is limited. I don't need to spend class time doing this because I don't know what they're doing. This is something that they can do on their own and they can submit it, whether it's a Google Doc or a Google Form, however it is that they're submitting the information. Then the next thing they're going to do is this, this is one, and this is where I'm saying the next 60 seconds now is I want you to watch the video, and this time I want you to put on the French closed caption, no English closed captions, and do the same thing. Now I want you to write down anything else you understood. So we're scaffolding, and I'm okay with this because they've listened to it to do the listening. The French captions are giving them some reading practice. We all know if you've ever watched... Um, a film, a foreign film, when you put the subtitles on, like if I watch a film in Spanish, I, I, I can speak Spanish, but I, I, if I'm watching a movie in Spanish, it's just too hard for me to understand it all. But if I put on the Spanish subtitles while I'm watching a Spanish movie, it really aids in my comprehension. It not only comprehension, but it helps me learn a lot of new phrases also. So I, 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 so for this one, especially at the novice, I'm letting them use it with the French closed captions on the third step. And then the fourth step is now taking everything you learned in one, two, and three, just give me some general information in English is fine about what you understood in the video. Okay. So at this point, they have watched this video at least five times and have a lot of information. Okay. And that's really, that's just the first 60 seconds of the video. But think about that's a lot that they can do with that 60 seconds. And again, this is a scaffold. Some kids may be able to breeze through this so fast. They don't even, they're like, by the end of it, they're like, I can understand everything. Other kids may be like, you know what? I got to go back and watch it even more. And that's okay. I did want to put this note that I found um, yesterday. And it happened to be on this Disney video that they were watching. Is that on some YouTube videos, and I'm not sure why some have it and some don't. But some videos, if you look down below the video, you see a word that says share. And then next to it, there's three, like three dots. And if you click on those three dots, it'll give you an option to, to click on the transcript for the video. So not the, the closed caption, but an actual transcript where it's written out. And some of the videos I picked had it and some of them didn't, but it's definitely something to check because that's another way that you could provide scaffolding or make it a reading activity, especially if a student doesn't have internet access, internet access, is that you could print, you can copy and paste the transcript into a document and tell the students you can watch the video and read the video at the same time, or it, you know, if, they, if you need that extra help. So again, that universal design for learning, it allows you to give a lot of different options. While we were doing the live session, some teachers were going in and were looking at um, <clears throat> some videos and some were able to find it and some weren't. So again, it doesn't exist for every video, but double check, see if it's there. Um, I don't know if it's something maybe you have to set up in advance or whatever, but I just discovered that um, when I was looking at the Disney, Disney video and I'm like, oh, that's cool. Okay, so, so that's again, some of the things that, that the kids are going to do. And I'm going to jump back over to the teacher part now. So they're going, they're practicing the video, they're practicing the vocab and stuff like that that they learned. Okay, so now, like we said, day one was they had to go into the Disney website and they had to look at the homepage and they looked at Disney characters and they looked at the attractions and the rides. Those were their reading comprehensions. Now, what we're going to do in class after that is I'm, you know, going on the assumption that hopefully at least some of them did what they were supposed to do, which I know, hopefully, I mean, there's always kids who didn't, which we'll talk about in a second, but hopefully some of them just did it. But even if they didn't, I'm going to show you what, what we're going to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a PowerPoint or Google Slides with about 10 to, or 15 different images with or without text or just the text from the Disneyland website from those three places that I had them look at. And what I want them to do is as I, as I show each slide, I want the students to categorize the image just with the video and they don't have to show their face. They can just show their hand or whatever. And as I show each slide, I want them to hold up one finger if this is just general visitor information on the screen, two fingers if it's about a hotel, three fingers if it's an attract, a park attraction, and four fingers if it's referring to a Disney character. So the thing with this is, is that the students who did, hopefully they're doing it, the ones who did it will have an easier time doing it. But even students who didn't do this assignment yet, maybe they're like, I just haven't gotten to it yet, notice that they could still do this even if they haven't done the assignment. And what it's going to do is sort of like sort of a, like a backwards or sort of an inside out benefit is that they're going to look at it and realize, oh my gosh, I can understand a lot more and I haven't even looked at it. So again, just that confirmation that, okay, I may not understand everything, but oh my gosh, if I see, you know, Hotel Disney, I know that's hotel information. Or if I see, you know, a certain image of something, I know it's a Disney character. So again, even if they haven't done the reading comprehension yet, this activity 
will help give them a little bit of basis when they do go and do it. Um, so I know that because that was an issue of, uh, that came up in one of our other ones about what do you do when you plan a lesson and some kids did the stuff ahead of time and some kids didn't do the stuff ahead of time when you have the video conference. Do you just sit there? Do they just sit there and not learn? Do they do separate things? And so again, the goal is to come up with a way that's going to help the kids interact with the information in whatever way. If you think about your real classroom, when you assign homework, not every kid does their homework. And so when we come in and we expect, we've all been there where we had the kids do homework and expected to run the lesson based on the homework and then the kids didn't do it and then the whole lesson fell. So it's not like what's happening in remote classrooms is any different than what happens in our face-to-face -face classroom. So I think all of us have found, and I shouldn't say all of us, I'll speak for myself personally, that I really got away from basing my lesson on the homework when I if I realized that I had like a group of kids who just weren't doing their homework um, that I didn't develop my lesson around what I expected them to do for homework and again this is you know that gets to a whole other thing about expectations and life skills and everything and the students but just just to sort of address that issue of what do you do when the kids haven't done the stuff ahead of time this is some examples of how you can do it Okay, so anyway, so that was the first thing. So we look at this together, they categorize with their fingers. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put them in their breakout rooms and maybe you could do that with those pods we talked about. Make sure the kids have a role, like who's the leader this time around. And I'm going to give them about six or eight of those same slides that we just looked, looked at. And what I want the kids to do, so they'll have to open that slideshow um, in, their, you know, in their classroom, make a copy of it, whatever, you know, however you set it up in your Google Classroom or give them the link to make a copy of it. Um, have all that arranged ahead of time. <laughs> and what they're going to do is I want them in their group uh, of those six to eight slides is I want them to rank, to arrange the slides in the order of highest to lowest interest to them. Of If these were eight things that you were gonna do today at Disneyland Paris, what's the order that you would do them in based on your highest interest to the lowest interest? And what we're going to do, because I really want them to you know, stay in the target language as much as possible, even if I'm not in there, which again, is we, we hope by giving them the information, they'll do it. You know, maybe even one of the roles is like, you're the target language police, that anytime a kid speaks in English, you give them a ticket or something, I don't know, something whose one kid's role is actually to make sure everyone speaks the target language. But what we're going to do is before I send them in the breakout rooms, I'm going to give them some of the expressions that they need, need to do this and I'm, going to, and I'm going to model it. So I'm going to pull one up and I'm going to say, okay, here's the things. Here's how you say, first, I would do this. Second, I would do this. Third, I want to do this. Fourth, I want to do this. And I'm actually going to do the activity together so the class can see it before I send them in the breakout rooms. Okay, and then once, you know, say they're in the breakout rooms for, you know, I don't know, five or 10 minutes, whatever, then I'm gonna have them come back out of the breakout rooms. I'm gonna put up a Mentimeter. If you remember from other sessions, that's that poll feature that has a lot of different things. And one of the polling features is that you can list like six or 10 or whatever, and people can rank them in the order of their preference. So I'm gonna take those same six to eight topics, I'm gonna to put them in the Mentimeter, and I'm gonna have all the students go in and rank them according to the order that they would do them for their preference. And then once we have the ranking on the Mentimeter for the whole class, just do a little bit of conversation, whether it's in the mic or with, you know, sharing on the mic or doing the chat box about, you know, I agree with number one, or I disagree with number two, or I, you know, I don't wanna do number four or something like that. And so what we're doing in here is this is all things that are in the target language. It's very accessible to the students. We don't need to use any English with any of this. Whether they did the homework or not, they can do it. But we're also building up, because remember, some of the outcomes are to be able to talk about what you would do on a trip, giving recommendations, giving suggestions, giving opinions. And so all of this is just very simplified ways of giving opinions, giving recommendations, talking about what you want to do. So it's very simple scaffolding to get them ready throughout the outcome or throughout the unit. Okay, now the last day, what's going to go on? So the last day of five days, you know, in, in you know, this is how I planned it. Who knows how it, you know, we all know how it's actually going to turn out, if it, this could get done in a week or not, we'll find out, is that the kids then are, have, have an option to create something. Um, and they have two options. And it's really the same option in A and B, but I think sometimes kids feel better if they have a choice. I think we all do. So um, you, option A is that you want to convince your family to go to Disneyland Paris for vacation. So you have the choice and I'm giving the choice, but maybe you just are like, I just want the kids to write, or I just want the kids to do a video. So you could do whatever you want. So your choice is you can either make a visual, a visual or video promo that highlights the best parts of Disneyland Paris and why you should all go on vacation. And then you're going to upload either the link to the video or the visual to a Google slide. 
Okay. The other option, if the kids are like, oh, I don't want to go with my family on vacation. I'd rather go somewhere with my friends or I'd rather do something else, whatever. And they could do that. If they're like, Hey, I want to convince my friends and they say, Hey, could I do my friends in front of my family? And I might even actually throw that in now that I think about it. So yeah, pick whoever, whoever you want to go with. All right. Option B. So if they're like, oh, I don't want to do that one. Option B, imagine that you work for a marketing firm, a very strong possibility for a lot of kids in their career. And you have been hired by Disneyland Paris to create a promo flyer or a video for the park. And so the same thing, you're going to cre create either a visual or a video and you're going to upload it to a Google slide. So they both end up with the same result. They end up with either a visual or a video that is going to be uploaded to a Google slide that's promoting Disneyland, Disney parks. And any instructions we talked about earlier, how, how much harder everything is online than it is when you're face to face. And this is something that I think I, I can't remember now if I mentioned it earlier or not. I know Catlin Tucker mentions it in her blog. I know it's in the, um, the Hattie book that I told you about is that include step-by-step -step written instructions and a quick video, uh, video recording of you giving the instructions. And it's fine to do them in English because you're, you're just giving an instructions and it's not an interpretive task with maybe the model. By giving them both written and video instructions, it's gonna help the kids understand it better. If parents are helping them, it's gonna help the parents. Some people are better reading things. Some people are better with video. Some have a hard time. Like I have a hard time just listening to video. I like to see the text, et cetera. So again, offline is so much harder when the kids aren't with us and we want remember we talked about we want them to become independent autonomous learners so giving them a couple different ways to access the instructions remind them that they have their pod if you you know if you set up those little pods of four people if you're not sure either email me email somebody in your pod or whatever so that's what they're going to they're going to actually create and so they're going to be able to create it now because they've watched all the videos they've seen a video they've seen the website so they know what this type of promotional material will look like. What we're gonna do in class before they have to do that is, um, and this is actually where I just put up here in blue to create the video recording. I also put an option that another thing you might wanna include, especially if you're like, for my students, it's gonna be hard for them to do a video or it's really hard for them to do a graphic or something like that. You could have them, or a flyer, you might give them another option and say that they could just do a, a PowerPoint and it could either be like a voiceover like a voiceover slide presentation in Google, or they could send me the PowerPoint and record a Google voice, however you want to do it. Or instead of making an actual flyer, maybe they just do a graphic organizer of the features of Disney. So again, just some suggestions about if you need to scaffold it more for kids or if there's, you know, every, there's situations that you have. Again, just giving different options for the kids to to produce because they're all still going to produce the same thing it's can you give me information about show me what you have learned about disneyland paris that's really what the goal of this is so what we're going to do in the session today is we're i'm going to show them my examples i'm going to use very simple target language information to explain it to them um, I, if I have the video ahead of time, maybe if I, you know, if I'm on my game and have it done ahead of time, that might, maybe that's the homework is they watch the video ahead of time, but I'll have some flyers. We'll work with it a little bit, have, a, do a little bit of back and forth target language, either video or chat box, et cetera. And then I'm going to send them off to start working on their own. I like the idea of them being able to start working on it on their own during our face-to-face -face time or our synchronous time because if they get stuck or it, you know and they can come back to me right there and a lot of times I found with the teaching and I'm sure you have found the same thing the kids tend to do better if they have some time in class to actually start the project or do an outline or do a graphic organizer they're much more inclined to keep doing it outside of class if they had to, because a lot of times starting is the hardest part for kids so if we started it together um, it's going to allow them hopefully to be a little bit more successful. Okay, so that was a lot for, for week one. But again, because I had to tell you this, a lot of this would just, like I said, we would, as teachers, this would just really be in our brain. Okay, now daily lesson plans for week two. Notice the same thing, it's very detailed. But you'll notice week two is a lot easier than week one because basically what I'm doing, if you look at the outcomes, it's still the different modes, some interpersonal, a little bit of reflection has been thrown in there that's actually going to be in the target language, et cetera. If you look at the asynchronous, they're going to be doing the exact same, almost the exact same thing that they did with the Disneyland website and video promo video. They're going to do the exact same thing from the Parc Asterix website and the, uh, the Parc Asterix promo video. Literally the exact same type of examples. You can see in red, same activities at Disneyland Paris, same activities, same activities. 
The good thing about that is this time around, it's going to be much easier for the students. Even though it's a different website, it's a different type of video, different attractions, now they're used to it. They know how to access a website. They know how to navigate through a video and get, you know, pull out words and stuff like that. So the second week, it's easier for the kids because now it's familiar. And it's easier for me because they're doing the same thing. I've already created this once. And now all I have to do is just cut and paste the, the Parc Asterix stuff instead of putting in the Disneyland Paris. So the second week is much, much easier, those first four days. Okay, we'll get to the fifth day in a second. Um, and notice that um, the synchronous, so it's a little bit different and it's a little bit similar. So remember they had to create those flyers or those videos for the, the, the Disney back that was their homework or their assignment or whatever back on the end of the last week. So I'm going to give them a few days to work on that. Depending when you see the kids, it could be like five days later. Now what I'm going to do is I don't want them to just have created that and then we don't do anything with it, you know, because then kids are like, why am I even working so hard? And so I, and actually now that I think about it, I would tell them ahead of time what we're going to do with their ads so they know that there's actually a purpose. So maybe hopefully that will also be some incentive to, you know, kids who tend to, you know, if they're like, oh, this is going to blow this off. Maybe they'll put a little bit more incentive in it a little bit more um, effort because they realize it's actually going to be used somehow. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to post, um, remember every kid had to put their um, image in a slot, in a Google slide or however you want to do it. I'll just say Google slide or PowerPoint, whatever. And I'm going to put those all together into one big slideshow. And I'm going to have a number on each slide. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slow show this, share the slideshow and show it on my screen. And I'm just going to pick out a few ads you know, and just talk about in the target language um, model, how do I point out like what's appealing in the ad? Like, oh, I really like these images or I really like the options for activities or the music is really good. And again, it's the same thing. I'm going to give them those chunks of language that they can use to do this and I'm gonna model it. So again, we can stay in the target language. Then what they're going to do after I've done this for, I don't know, four or five, whatever, is then the kids are going to go in the chat box and they're going to do the same thing. They're going to look at the slideshow and they're going to pick, you know, number four, I really like the music or number six, I really like the, you know, whatever. But they're going to be doing it in French now because the ads are in French and because I've given them the expressions they need. And it could be even be word. They could say number four, music, number seven, you know, activité or something like that. They could even do it in words. I'm not that concerned with it. Now, a question that came up, which I thought was a very good question that came up during today's session was, how do you determine who's, which students to pick? Because will students feel bad that, oh, she, you know, she likes theirs better than mine, or I feel bad that she must think mine is bad because she didn't pick mine or something like that. And so, which I thought was a good question. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that, but I think it's very typical, especially if you're dealing with, you know, younger middle school or, their, or younger kids. I think older kids probably don't care as much. But um, the first thing to keep in mind is that they already would have gotten feedback from me when they turned in their slides. So whether I gave them some written feedback, whether I gave them, you know, a little, I we did that little where you could use a Google feedback or whatever. So they've already gotten some feedback from me on the slide. But it's a very valid point that what am I going to do in class? And there are lots of. Um, apps, and I know Leslie Gran has a lot that she mentions too. There's one that's called Wheel Decide, and it's wheel like W-H-E-E-L, and it's just a digital wheel that you spin around. I know there's things where there's like dice that you can put how many numbers you want on the dice, like you can have like, you know, up to 25 numbers on the dice or whatever. So I think to, to address the issue of kids feeling bad that theirs didn't get picked, I would probably um do that wheel decide or spin it spin the wheel or do a dice where it's a random pick versus me choosing so i think that was a really good question to really focus on sort of that sel effective so i'm glad whoever asked that question during the session i'm glad they asked that because it was it's a good thing to have that randomizer on there um, and you could even maybe do it for the second one. Just so kids are like, oh, nobody picked my video. Maybe you do the same thing too. You do the randomizer and it's like, everybody do number 17, everybody, or everybody do an odd number. Or, I don't know, whatever you want to do. So at any rate, but what we're going to do is we're starting to work on how do I say, how do I choose a destination? What appeals to me in ads? Okay. So the fourth day, um, we're going to do we're going to start planning sort of an itinerary and it's sort of similar to what we had done with the Disneyland. But what we're going to do is I'll just same thing. I'll pick a couple students ads and I'm going to talk about what I would do based on that ad. What would I do first? What would I do next? What would I do last? So it's similar to remember before they just had to organize the slides and now they're actually going to talk about and we're actually using the students ad. So now I'm not using the stuff I created. I'm taking what the kids created and I'm using that resource as much as I can. 
Okay. And so then they're going to talk about, you know, I'll do a few examples. What am I going to do? Then I put them in their breakout rooms, screen share the Disney ad, someone screen shares the ads in their group, and they talk about what they would do on the ads using the thing. So, oh, if I were on, you know, using this ad, I would do this or this, or if I, if, you know, if we watch this video, I would do this first and that, et cetera. So again, they're doing that practice together first so they can see what it looks like. They have the target language that they need because I provided it, and then they just keep doing that. I feel like this video is going way longer than, like this afternoon, I think it was 80 minutes. I feel like I'm way past that. So, but at least it's recorded so you can take a break whenever you need to. Okay, and then you'll notice the third synchronous session, I'm doing exactly what we did on Disney where we did the, um, remember how they had to category, categorize with one finger, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers. I'm doing the exact same thing, except I'm doing it with the information from the podcast lyrics. Okay, so again, this is nice for me because I don't have to come up with anything new except for some different images on my slides. It's nice for the students because they're like, oh yeah, we already did this once, we know exactly what to do. Okay, so that's sort of the first two weeks. Now, what the next activity that the kids are going to do is there at the end of the week is they're gonna do a Venn diagram where they're gonna do the similarities and differences between Disneyland Paris and the Parc Asterix. Because remember, that's one of the things um, in their interpersonal is the outcome of being able to compare different parks and talk about where you want to go. So whereas two weeks ago, they knew nothing probably about either one of these parks. Now they've got tons of knowledge because we've worked on it together. They've watched promo videos. They've gone to the website. Hopefully if they've, if they've done their homework, they obviously can't do this without. But so now not only have we built the knowledge for the unit, but now they have background knowledge that they can use when they make this Venn diagram and when they do the next activities. So what I put up here, and again, like I said, I just did two weeks, but just as I was brainstorming this unit, and I'm sort of like um, thinking, boy, I almost, I hope, I hope someone can use this information because I, since I don't have any options right now to go either to a high school classroom or to go to my, my French or ESL kids at Columbus State, I'm sort of in limbo with teaching right now. I'm sort of like, I, I really want to actually teach this now, but hopefully some of you can use this. So I was just, as I was writing the lesson, I started um, just automatically things started popping up in my brain about, oh my gosh, they could totally do this. They could totally do this. I'm sure that happens with you. You know how you sort of get in the zone and you start a couple of things and then all these ideas start flying. So I just wrote down some activities of what I'd probably do the next week. And so one thing would be after they have their Venn diagram with Disneyland Paris and Parc Asterix is I would have them then add a third circle where now they compare an amusement park in Ohio or the USA of their choosing. And again, we get back to that question about, well, some kids may not know one. So what I would do is I would give them some websites just in case. So I might give them Cedar Point, Kings Island, maybe Disneyland in Florida or, or Disneyland in California or Disney World or Six Flags. I would give them some options. So if they don't, no one already, they can go to a website because the good thing is now, and I might even give them some a promo video too, because now they have watched websites from, or they've looked at websites for amusement parks, they've watched promo videos. So I'll give them a couple for some USA ones. I don't care that they're in English. That's okay. Um, or maybe actually if we can even find it in French, I don't know. But I don't care if it's in English, but then they're going to do a third circle on the Venn diagram in the target language though, they don't get to put their stuff in the Venn diagram in English, but they can get the information in English. I'm okay with that. So again, they're taking the knowledge, the background knowledge they already built with these two parks, and they're using that knowledge now to analyze a, a, a park in the US or Ohio. Okay, so that's one thing I would have them do. Another thing I would have them start doing now is I would have them um, start choosing just different destinations and weather um, da, 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 da. Okay, so I would have them pick a destination and a weather, and I would have them start making, um, practice making packing lists and simple itineraries of what they would do at those different locations. And make, you know, it can be in a Google Doc, it can be in a Google Slide, however you want to have the kids do it. Maybe you make some video, maybe you make some flip grids so the other kids can comment, however you want to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm going to have the kids make a bunch of those. And here's why I'm having the kids make a bunch of them. And I'm going to tell them this ahead of time is I'm going to take what they've made. I'm going to take their packing list and their itineraries and destinations. And I'm going to turn that into a matching activity, like a reading or a video, however you want to do it, if it's Flipgrid. And so I'm going to make a list of the destination. You know, maybe I'll pick six or seven or something in a, in a chunk. I'll pick six destinations, six related activities that the kid or six itineraries and six packing lists. And I will sort of mix and match them in three columns. And then the students have to read 
the destination and they have to match, okay, what would be a, an appropriate, what would be the appropriate list of activities and packing list to go with it? So it's just sort of like a fun matching activity, but it's, so it's a production thing. The kids have produced all the information. I don't have to produce it. And so, but then again, they get to actually see that something they created is being used by the rest of the class, you know, and it was I able to stump somebody or something like that. So again, let the kids do the work and then I'll take it back. And this could be something, maybe it's something that we do together as something fun. Maybe it's something asynchronous. I don't know. Maybe we do a few together to have some fun and then they do the rest on their own, whatever. Um, another thing that we could do is we could use Google Street View and go to visit Disneyland Paris and the Parc Astérix. I know with the students, we would do that with the Paris monuments. So I'm going to take them to Street View and let's go visit the two parks together and do something, you know, do something with that. Um, another thing is, as I want, I still have those other videos, like the video of the Disney surprise where the kids get the trips to Disneyland. I still have that 50 minute documentary. So maybe though, since those are a little more complex or, or just to vary things up, I'm going to do some things with Ed puzzles. So I'm going to make some Ed puzzles and some other activities using those. So again, basically what I'm doing is I'm taking everything that we did, like sort of this intensive unit outlined here on these two pages. And I'm literally just cutting, copying and pasting from the itiner from the activities I planned and putting it into here. And I'm not telling you anything new. This is what we all do as teachers, but just sort of showing you with that from the perspective of it's going to be online and face-to-face -face and not always together about just the thinking process that went through it. The other thing also is just to stress again that this is always a dynamic process and it's constantly changing. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I can't remember if I said this or not, if I said it in the, in the live one or if I said it now, so I apologize if I, re, if I repeat, is that <clears throat> even as I was going through the process and I was sort of coming up with the resources that I was going to use, I realized that, you know what, I changed what I was going to do in the interpersonal a couple times. And I actually changed what I was going to do in the presentational. Not a lot, not a big change, but I tweaked it a little bit. And then as I was going through, so then I sort of had this all planned. And then I was going to the daily activities. And as I was planning the daily activities, I'm like, you know what, that really doesn't work the way I thought it was going to do. So then I would go back and I would adjust something in here, or I would adjust something down in the daily activities based on here. So again, that's why like just doing a week or two at a time, and I know different districts, some are like, you got to have six weeks worth of lessons for the kids to work on at once. And so again, everybody has their own situation. But we all know as teachers, if you plan too far out, and then something goes astray, then all of a sudden you got to redo a bunch of stuff. So just to stress again, that this was a very interactive and dynamic process that each thing that I was doing, I was sort of building my own background knowledge as I was doing it and it was helping me. Oops, hang on for a second. Sorry, I keep, um, I keep losing my screen. Um, hang on for a second. Where was it? There it goes. Okay, so um, it's just showing that, um, Sorry, I hope this is still showing. I hope I, I accidentally lost the screen. I hope you didn't lose it on the video, but if, if you did, I think we're far along, far enough along that you're okay. But just again, to express that it's just a dynamic process where one informs the other. Okay, so those are just some examples of what, again, this is just me thinking about, none of us have actually been in the situation. So I, or you may be like, oh yeah, this sounds really good. And then you get in there and you're like, oh my gosh, this totally isn't working. And that's okay. It's, it goes back to, we talked about, um, I think the very first session we did in June, or one of the ones was planning for uncertainty, where we think of what the scenario will probably look like, <clears throat> and we plan for how, how could we possibly succeed in that scenario. And if that is the scenario, then it's great. And if the scenario, cha scenario changes, at least we already have something and we're not starting from scratch. Okay, the last thing I wanna share with you, and again, this is really long, but um, is the assessment. I told you I had an assessment that goes with this. So I'm hoping I'm sharing my screen. I no longer have a second video because my other computer, <laughs> the battery ran out. So I'm gonna share my screen with the assessment. If it's not showing on my screen, you can go in, it's handout number three in the Google folder. So just really quickly, I'm gonna show you what the assessment actually looks like. Um, and this is based on, oops, um, this is based on the one that I, I, like I said, it's one that I originally did, but I've tweaked it now based on um, the new situation and everything. So like I said, if it's not showing on my, my screen, I apologize. Just pull up handout number three. And so this summative assessment, 
It's novice mid. And again, you could take this and you could totally take this whole unit and you could bump it up for interpretive. Because that's one thing I, I, I'm sort of going off the assessment here for just a second. Excuse me as I go off on a tangent. But as I was writing this whole unit, I'm like, my gosh, this takes a lot of time to do. And I'm like, if I were, you know, with French, I usually had French one, two, three, and four, and even AP, you know, as, as a lot of times you have a lot of preps. I'm like, I'm totally making everybody do a travel unit, the first unit, and I'm going to tweak this for upper level kids. Um, you know, for my level two, three, and four kids, or at least maybe my level three and four or something like that, I'm going to, I'm not going to spend all this time on one unit and then do all this, something completely different for the other ones that, so that's something that I recommended this a lot when I worked with, when we were working face to face with teachers. And I still do is that when you have a lot of preps to do is if you can, especially knowing how proficiency works now and how we've talked about scaffolding activities and, and ways to use authentic resources, if you can do similar themes and outcomes at different levels at the same time, it makes your job so much easier. So if I could do a similar travel unit with my level three kids, I would just bump up what they have to say and you know maybe get something a little bit more in depth. They could look at more resources a little bit more deeply, et cetera, have you know some of those reflection questions could be in the target language. But that's probably um, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I give to teachers and because I found it through my own experience was when I could teach the same thing to a lot of different classes levels at once it just made my brain happier and it made my workload easier etc okay so just a little tangent all right let's look at the assessment and then i'm gonna i'm gonna end the video because it's really long okay so basically um the interpretive reading as, as we said was going to be some pages from the disneyland paris hotel so again i'm on handout three if it's not showing on my screen and i just screenshotted and so what i did is i made sure ahead of time the pages and the videos that I, were go I was going to use ahead of time for the assessment. So I did not use those during the unit. I made sure I didn't shoot anything that was in the assessment. I let them see things that were similar, but I didn't give them the actual pages because I wanted to see what can you actually do now spontaneously. But so here's the two pages. There's, there's a page with um, some of the different hotels, um, <clears throat> some things with some specials that were going on, and then some different things with like, I, I picked like four hotels. There's like a ton of hotels to pick from. So I picked some that weren't um, in the things we did throughout the unit. All right, so and it's just some questions. I based it on that actual Appendix D. We did some prior knowledge, even though they we built the knowledge still, even in the assessment. Okay, what do you already know about Disneyland in the USA or in France? What experiences do you have related to it? So think about now already they're like, oh my gosh, I already know this and this and this and this. So when they go into this activity, they're going to be able to show me what they know because they now have built up that background knowledge and that, that ability to read websites and watch videos, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that because it's not like I want to see, I, that was the whole point of the unit is that I was building you to be able to do this. This is the outcome of the unit. So if you can do it and you can build up, you can pull that knowledge that we built, that's beautiful because that's what I want you to do. Okay, so we just do some, yeah, I don't need to read all this. You can look over this. So we just do some questions, you know, what do the icons mean, et cetera, some general things. You can look at this yourself. You don't need me. A little bit of context clues. Um, a little bit more in depth, looking at the name of the hotels. What type of visitors do you think they're trying to attract? What marketing strategies are evident in the design? So think about all those lessons where we talked about what made you choose your classmate thing. I like the music. I like the image or whatever. So pulling back in all those things that we did throughout the unit, pulling them back into the summative assessment. Okay. Okay. And then just, you know, which hotel would you stay in and why, you know, make it purposeful. If I'm looking at these hotels, it's because I'm going to stay in one. All right. So that's the interpretive reading. The interpretive listening or viewing, if you were in ASL, was I had mentioned that there's all those videos about kids getting trips to Disneyland. So this one, this note right here, and I put the YouTube link, I, this note would not be on the student's version. I put this just for the teachers who are reading this, is that the video that the one that they're going to watch at this YouTube link is it's a little three-year-old girl. She's adorable, a French girl, and she's celebrating her third birthday. And she gets a birthday card from Mickey Mouse telling her that she's traveling to Disneyland Paris. And I love this video because um, first off, it's a birthday party. It's a three-year-old who's adorable. Um, also, the mom is reading her the card from Mickey Mouse. So the mom reads very simple language. She reads very clearly, very slowly. It's total novice language. So it's just a great, it's one of all the videos I looked at. I'm like, this is a perfect one for kids to sort of access on their own during an assessment. So, and then they just answer some questions. And this one's not quite as in depth as the Disney one. It was just more general things. Like, why is the family together? 
Okay. And so there, you can be like, oh, obviously they're celebrating a birthday because the girl's got like a little tiara on and they've got like some cake on the table and everything like that. And they hear the word anniversaire, which is birthday in French and all sorts of things. So Number two, why is a little girl so excited? So hopefully they can pick out that um, they hear the word Mickey Mouse and they hear Disneyland and they hear tra Le train, the train that they can pick out. Oh my God, she's going to Disneyland. Oh my gosh, she's going to Disneyland Paris on the train or something like that. There's a boy sitting next to her in the video and it could be a brother or a cousin. He looks like he's probably maybe, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old. And so just sort of an inference. If the boy in the video got a card, what do you think his card might say? So his might say, hey, you're going to Legoland or his might say, you know, we're taking you on a trip to Italy. I don't know, whatever you want. So just a little inferencing about what his card might say. And then number four is just real open. Just tell me three other things that you understood from the video and they can say whatever they want, phrases or whatever. Again, trying to keep, again, we try and keep the questions open-ended because it's not, we want the kids to show us what they know. I don't want to say you have to know this. I want you to show me what you know. Okay. And then, so that's what number four is sort of tell me some other stuff that you understood that I didn't even ask about. And then number five, I like to, it's just a little cultural reflection. What do you notice in the video that's similar to or different from our culture? So they may be like, oh, I noticed like that there's a baby gate that's similar, you know, because the girl's like toddler. There's a baby gate that's similar to what I have in my house. Or I noticed that um, the names or, or the, way, the way the cake is looks different than what we have. Or I noticed that the clothing was a little different or that the tablecloths are the same. I noticed that they had, you know, lots of bottles of wine, I don't know, whatever, on the table. So just some things for them to talk about what's similar, what's the same and different when we're doing this. Okay. So that's our interpretive piece. And the inter interpersonal, I had already mentioned earlier, um, is going to be conversations that they'll have a choice. And so I had a couple different ways we could do it, whether it was face-to-face -face or, um, you know, asynchronous or whatever. Um, <clears throat> when I did conversations with groups of kids, I used the ODE rubrics. Those were way back on one of the earlier pages. Um, also, if you want to use the ODE rubrics, our rubrics and feedback session is on is next Monday. So we'll look at those more in depth. But um, I have a separate rubric for every student who's doing it. And so as each student is talking, I'm scoring each of them individually. It's not a group grade. So usually I would put the kids in groups of two to three and I would make, I would set a timer and make them talk for at least five or six minutes to make sure I got enough language from the students. Um, it's a little bit different with virtual. The other thing that I would also do, just a little sidebar, because a lot of times teachers would ask, well, what happens if some of the kids don't talk or one kid talks all the time, is I was never shy about inserting myself into the conversation. So if there was a student who wasn't saying anything, I would jump in and ask them a question and say, hey, you know, uh, John, kiss could you ball? You know, what do you think about this or, or something like that? So, and the kids who are talking a lot, maybe I would also jump in with them and bump it up to see, can I get them higher? You know, they're speaking in some simple words and phrases. Can I get some sentences out of them? So I was never shy about jumping into the group to help if I wasn't getting enough information from someone or if this conversation sort of lagged, but also for the kids who were doing great to see, hey, can I push this kid higher? So, but to do that, you really have to set up enough time, you know, five or six minutes per group. And I could do that, we could do that digitally or we could do it face to face. So you could either be doing this in person, again, with social distancing, even if we're in person, we still may be doing it on our Chromebooks with earbuds and a Zoom call or a Google Meet. Or the kids could do it in Zoom breakout rooms or Google Meet, the same thing. Um, but make sure if you're not in there with them, that they have to record their session with their face. Because if I'm, if I'm not in there and I'm scoring this, I need to know who's talking and who's saying what. So just a couple different options of how you could do it. Again, the first few times you may want to do it with the kids. And then once they sort of get the handle of it later on, they may do it on their own or whatever. So just some options for face-to-face -face or um, asynchronous. So the two options that they have, we already talked about this earlier, it's spring break, you want to go to Disneyland Paris, other kids want to go somewhere else, no one's allowed to change, have the conversation. And so now they do have the, the um, ability to talk about, I want to go to Disneyland Paris because we can do this and we can do this, we can do this. And other kids can draw on something that they've already done. Well, I want to go, you know, to Hawaii because of this, or I want to go to Kings Island, or I want to go to, you know... I don't know, New York City, whatever they want. It doesn't matter because they can just, the goal is that can they use the knowledge from Disneyland Paris and well, really the ultimate goal is can I convince someone and tell why I want to go on a trip. And then the other option was, remember, they could have a conversation with friends about what you would do if you went to Disneyland Paris and why. 
compare Disneyland Paris to other amusement parks in France or the US. And so now, remember in the beginning of the unit, they didn't have, most of them didn't have the knowledge to do this. Now, by virtue of having done this unit, they have the ability to do it. And maybe you put an option, maybe it's that you, these could be Parc Asterix or Disneyland. I mean, you could change it up, whatever you want, okay? So that's the interpersonal. And then the presentational, since the interpersonal was a speaking, so we had reading and listening, or viewing if you're ASL, we had an interpersonal speaking or signing. And so the presentational for the non-ASL languages, for the um, um, spoken languages is gonna be writing because now this way I've, I've covered all four skills. And again, we had talked about if you were doing micro units. So maybe in the micro unit, maybe I focus on, they just are working on the listening and the reading and they only have to do speaking. And then the second half of the micro unit, we do some more listening and reading and this time they do a presentational writing. So again, that would be a good way to, to break this into a micro unit because this could, this could turn into something really long and, and I think everything would sort of get lost. Okay, so the last part of the assessment is the presentational writing. Again, I like to give the kids a choice to choose one topic. Now, this is something I did. You don't have to do this. It's up totally up to you. But I always, when I was doing an assessment where I wanted like an actual decent paragraph, I gave my students a word count. And usually like in level one, by first semester, by the exam, like first semester exam, they had to write at least 100 words when they did their essay. By the end of level one, they had to write 150 words. By the end of level two, we, we gradually moved from 150 to 200 words. And then after level two and above, that kids always had to write at least 250 or more words. I did that because I know sometimes people are like, write at least 10 sentences, but you know, a sentence can have two words. They could write 20 words and say, hey, I wrote, I wrote you know, 10 sentences or whatever. So, and the other thing that we did is we would practice in class about how to start building sentences where we would put a word on the thing like, I'm going, and then we would do a, a game or an activity where they'd work with a partner and they'd see who could come up with the longest sentence just starting with I'm going by, and we'd say, you know, use who, what, where, when, why, how. So then it would be like, I'm going to the park with my friend to eat chocolate with my dog after school when it's raining in the spring or whatever so we would practice over and over how to build sentences so when i'm expecting them to write 150 words it's not off the top of their head it's not something that we haven't prepped for and again at this point we'd probably be in second semester doing a unit like this to make sure they had the background language so they could easily do 150 words Someone did ask a question during the live session today. Um, <laughs> she said, does it have to be 150 new words? And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, because I don't even, it, it just has to be 150 words in French. If they, if they use English words, you know how sometimes a kid will throw a word in English because they don't know it in French. I'm like, I'm not counting that. It has to be 150 target language French words, which I thought was actually a good question because you, um, which it does make sense. So it's just 150 words in the target language. And what happens is the kids start to realize the longer I make my sentences, the easier it is to write. Because if they realize, if I'm writing three and four word sentences, it's gonna take me forever to get to 150 words. Whereas if I'm writing sentences with 10 to 15 words, it's gonna be a lot easier to make a decent essay. So again, this is a skill that we work on the entire unit. It's not something that I just sort of throw them at it randomly. Or that, I'm sorry, we work on the entire year, I should say. Okay, so anyway, sorry, a little side note there. All right, our two topics for the presentational writing. So the first option is uh, saint jean à Paris, five days in Paris. So you and your family are going to Paris for five days. They're relying on you to be their tour guide. Plan your daily itinerary and the packing list for those five days. And, and I just give the kids some ideas. They don't have to do it, but a lot of times kids sort of blank, on, even though they've done this, they're like, I don't even know what to write about. So I just give them ideas. You know, you could talk about when you're going, who's going, what are you gonna do each day, what are you gonna visit, why, talk about what you're gonna pack and why you're packing that based on the weather, talk about how you're gonna get around Paris, anything else you want. So I, I try not to say, tell, one, one, tell where you're going, who you're going, one thing you're gonna do, five things you're gonna do. I try to not make it that um, specific because then the kids tend to only give you what you ask for. I think we talked about this in another one, another session we did about, I tried to give the kids a floor for the assessment. So the floor is that you have to plan your itinerary and a packing list for five days and you have to write 150 words, but the ceil there's no ceiling. So you can write about whatever you want. You can go above 150, you can include whatever you want, 
but so that's the goal when you're doing proficiency. Give the minimum that the kids have to do, but leave it open ended. Don't give it a ceiling. And I would just tell the kids, give me everything you know. You know, I'm looking for, you know, this is at least, you know, novice mid, novice high. Make sure they know those proficiency levels and, and tell them, impress me. Give me your best language for what you can do. Okay, so that was option one. If the kids don't like that option, the other one is service bagage, the baggage services. So you and your family have just arrived at the Paris airport, but the airline lost your suitcase. Very typical situation that could ha ha happen. The baggage agent is a very curious person. Um, he, he not only wants you to write down what was in your missing suitcase, because you know how sometimes you have to put that, like especially if you have to get reimbursed or whatever, but he also wants to know why you packed each item also. And obviously there's a reason I did that because I want to make sure in either one of, it doesn't matter whichever one of these they choose. Remember the goal was that they could plan an itinerary and they could do a packing list. So on this one, if they're telling about what they packed and why they packed it, they're still going to be giving me a sort of an itinerary because they're going to be telling me about the activities they were going to do in Paris. So this one, the floor is that you have to pick at least eight items just to give them a number because I don't want them to do like two or something. So pick at least eight items that were in your lost luggage and tell why you brought that item for your trip to Paris. And so then I give them some suggestions about things they could think about. Okay, so you could talk about maybe different clothes or shoes that you packed and what you were going to do with why you packed them. What were you going to do? Maybe talk about electronics you packed and what you were going to do with these. Talk about money you packed, which you should never do, <laughs> and things you were going to buy. Talk about photography items and photos you were going to take, about books you packed and where you were going to read them. And they can do this in the present tense. It doesn't have to be like would or going to. They could do it. In, or if they can use that, you know, near future, they could do that. Talk about weather-related items you packed and situations where you would need them or anything else you want. So it's that I tell them you don't have to do these. If you don't like any of those, you can choose whatever you want to write about. So at any rate, so that's the, that's the full assessment. Like I said, this doing it in class, if we were regular, I would probably just do it over three to four days, maybe, maybe not. But again, you've got your interpretive mode, you've got your inter interpersonal that builds on the interpretive, and then you have your presentational that builds on the in interpersonal. So if they can do this assessment, everything through the unit, this throughout the unit, it, it helps that they have now met the outcomes for the unit. Okay, this was really long, and so hopefully you were able to take a break in between. I know I went way over than I ever did it face-to-face -face this afternoon. So um, everything is in there. Feel free to email me if you have other questions. I tried to address all the questions that came up during today's live session. Like I said, there weren't a whole lot, but feel free to email me if you have any questions, and hopefully this has been helpful for you with your units. And then next week on Monday, I think it's Monday, is that like August 3rd, I think, is we're going to do feedback and rubrics. And we're actually going to, um, I'm going to bring in some writings from my ESL students. And we're going to actually look at, score those together. And then Wednesday, August 5th, is um, that sort of building commun uh, community and some like discipline or whatever in the online environment. My Ryan Wirtz, my colleague, is going to help with that one. We're both going to do that one. And then the following week of... Um, the 11th, 12th, and 13th is that big ODE event, and some of the things we have on tap, there's some big internet, um, like, blended learning things that are going to be, like, for anybody, and then content-specific, like I mentioned, we're going to do one about brand new students who have no language, what can we do with them? We're going to do just like, um, uh, what did I call it? I forget what it is. Here. Oh, like build your remote toolbox. We're just going to be, we're going to come together. We're going to get in Zoom breakout rooms. We're going to set up, everyone's going to have a Google Doc and it's just going to be everybody sharing ideas. And so, and then come back. And so when we leave, we have Google Docs full of ideas of what you can do. Um, and then we have some other ones planned. I forget exactly what. Okay. So thank you for listening. I know it was kind of long and hopefully I will see you next week.